might recall last year that this part of our studio garden was what we called our Native American plant garden. Alan Jobes built us a great old-timey porch and we had this filled with all kinds of plants. We had native wildflowers such as gallardia and purple coneflower. We also had native grasses here and some small native shrubs and it was very interesting. But of course in our studio garden we like to change the themes every year just to keep people interested and so forth. But we thought we'd stay with the historic theme and so this year we're planting an Oklahoma homestead garden. That old-timey porch just made us feel like we need to recognize the struggles that our forefathers um, had to go through in planting gardens. And so we've taken the liberty of uh, pruning one of our apple trees fairly severely and making teepees. And I want to go through some of the plants that we have in here and why we have them in our garden. And we've done three tall teepees out of apple tree prunings and homesteaders would have used whatever was nearby. They would have gone down to a creek bank and got saplings or maybe gone and gotten some river cane and tied that together to plant pole beans, peas, and other climbing plants. And so what we have in here is a, a variety of peas we've already planted called Tall Telephone. We've planted Kentucky Wonder beans, and I'm sure you're fam familiar with Kentucky Wonder, and that was grown back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And then right here, I've got speckled cranberry beans. Now, the settlers, when they first moved in, uh, out onto the open plains. The first thing they did was build a sod house and then they would do a garden because they didn't have a grocery store right around the corner. And so not only would they plant Kentucky Wonder Beans for fresh use and for canning, but they grow dry beans too. And these uh, Vermont cranberry or speckled cranberry beans would have been just the ticket to grow and harvest dry and store through the winter. They'd be a good source of fiber and protein for them through the winter time. We're gonna give them a little extra boost and moisten them and give them a little bit of legume inoculant. And of course, we've shown this before in Oklahoma gardening, but it is bean planting time. We want to remind you that to increase your yields by about 30%, if you'll moisten the seed first and then put a little inoculant on them, you can really bump that harvest up and introduce the beneficial bacterium to the soil. And back in the settlers' times, they might have had some native plants that were legumes that would have had some of the background inoculum in them. But we always do this just as a, an added measure of insurance in the garden. Now, if you're going to cut poles to make tripods like these, make sure that you secure them down in the ground real well. We, have, we loosen up our soil real well, and we have our poles about a foot down in the ground and they're tied up at the top real securely. In fact, we've tied some twine among the three at the top just to, to steady them up a little bit, just in case we get some real strong winds. And I've seen heirloom gardens where they have put teepees in a long straight line and indeed have strung some, some type of twine among them just to stabilize them a little bit. Well, as those come up, they should twine among these apple branches. We'll be able to sow some leafy salad crops under there this summer because it should be somewhat shaded. But right here, we've sown Stowell's Evergreen Sweet Corn. And in the late 1800s, that sweet corn variety was typical of what people would have grown. It is a white sweet corn. And a historian who's helping us plan this garden is named Stephen McCartney. And Mr. McCartney's specialty is studying plants that would have been grown between the 1880s and 1910 in gardens. And he told us that in the late 1800s, people thought of yellow corn as animal feed, and they wouldn't have eaten that, but they did eat white sweet corn, so that's why we've chosen this variety. Stephen McCartney has also recommended some tomato varieties that were typically grown back then. We have Radiator Charlie's Mortgage Lifter, and Mortgage Lifter is an heirloom tomato variety that a lot of people like to grow today because it, it does have kind of a unique name. And then just plain red cherry tomato would also typically have been grown back in those times. We have some that we started ahead, ahead of time, and rather than use walls of water and tomato cages and all those modern conveniences, we'll be tying these up to a stake, because that's typically what might have been done in a homestead garden, or they might have let them just be sprawling on the ground. 
Now back over here, one native shrub we've left is our wax myrtle. And if you were homesteading in southeastern Oklahoma, you would have valued one of these in your garden for the berries that could have been used to make bayberry candles. So we decided we'd leave that in place. Then back here we've put in some small seedlings of salsify or oyster plant and this is um, in the same family as carrots and parsnips and the settlers loved this plant because it tasted like oysters and people were oyster crazy in America in the late 1800s so they'd grow anything that would taste a little bit like them. Now over here on our lattice work in a couple weeks we'll be sowing some seed of cucumbers and we'll have two varieties boston pickling and west indian gherkin and that reminds me that a lot of the food that was grown in homestead gardens was grown either for fresh use right away or for preserving Now they didn't have a freezer didn't have a refrigerator so extra food was either dried like the beans that we planted or they made a lot of kraut or pickled a lot of items. And we have two varieties of cabbage here. We have early Jersey Wakefield and we also have Danish ball head. Now those are two varieties that typically would have been grown back then and one point we want to make is you can duplicate a garden like this in your own backyard and think about your ancestors and have access to those very same varieties today. These are very widely available ones that we've chosen that you could get at probably most any feed store or garden center. Now over here, they would have wanted some fresh spring greens. And uh, we've talked about corn salad or mache before, and that's over here. We've just sown a fresh crop of it, but we have some back over in our raised bed garden. And if you recall, in our winter salad garden, the corn salad was the most cold hardy. We're hoping it will also be somewhat heat tolerant as well, so we've sown some of that. Also, the settlers grew a lot of endive. It was a little tougher than some of the lettuces that we grow today, but it would give the same lettuce um, texture and, and flavor for salads and so forth. And then right here, I've plunked in a dandelion plant and our studio grounds crew is about ready to shoot me when they saw me go dig this up before we started taping and put this in. But we want to keep in mind that uh, homesteaders ate a lot of dandelion greens, especially in the spring, late winter and spring when they're coming up. If you'd had a diet all winter long of potatoes and turnips and so forth, your body would probably be crying for fresh greens. And so they did value and cultivate dandelion greens. So we're going to leave that in there for a little bit. Then over here, uh, they planted a lot of onions. Now Stephen McCartney tells me that they did not typically eat garlic. Garlic was frowned upon in Victorian days, but they did plant a lot of onions for fresh use and for uh, drying. And then back over here, we have a little patch of whorehound. And you've probably heard of eating whorehound cough drops. They have a very medicine-y taste. And uh, settlers valued and grew whorehound so that in the wintertime, if they had a cough they could mix up a whorehound syrup or their own whorehound cough drops. Then last of all, there wasn't much time or money for a lot of decorative elements, but they did grow nasturtiums. And these are some that the seed would have been easy to carry out onto the prairie because it was fairly large and they were fairly hardy, yet they are also edible. The nasturtium flowers could have been used with greens as a peppery flavor, but we put them around the porch here just kind of as a decorative touch. Well, I'm real excited about our homestead garden, and over the next few weeks, I think it's really going to shape up, and you'll enjoy seeing it grow. Be sure to come out and take a look at it. Well, over in our children's garden, Brenda has a neat project just getting started, and I know you're going to want to see. We hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. You can also find more recent videos on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.